So, uh, welcome back to the video. This is the Dunwick Horror. I'm continuing on part eight today. In the meantime, a quieter, yet even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself behind the closed doors of the shelf-lined room in Arden. The curious manuscript or diary of Wilbur Waitley delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among the experts in languages, both ancient and modern. Its very alphabet, notwithstanding a general resemblance to the heavily shaded Arabic used in Mesopotamia, being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial ap alphabet, giving the effect of a cipher. Though none of the usual methods of cryptographic solution seemed to furnish any clue, even when applied on the basis of every tongue the writer might conceivably have used. The ancient books, taken from Waitley's quarters, while absorbingly interesting and in several cases promising to open up new and terrible lines of research among philosophers and men of science, were of no assistance whatsoever in this matter. One of them, a heavy tome with an iron clasp, was in another unknown alphabet, this one of a very different cast and resembling that of Sanskrit more than anything else. The old ledger, was at length given wholly into the charge of Dr. Armitage, both because of his peculiar interest in the Waitley matter and because of his wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formulae of antiquity and the Middle Ages. Armitage had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults which have come down from the old time and which have inherited many forms and traditions from the wizards of the Saracenic world. That question, however, he did not deem vital, since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as he suspected, they were used as a cipher in a modern language. It was his belief that, considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own, save perhaps in certain special formulae or incantations. Accordingly, he attacked the manuscript with the preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. Dr. Armitage knew from the repeated failures of his colleagues that the riddle was a deep and complex one and that no simple mode of solution could merit even a trial. All through late August, he fortified himself with the mass lore of cryptography, drawing upon the fullest resources of his own library and waiting night after night amidst the arcane of Trithemesis, Polygraphia Giambetista, Portas de Furitivis Literarum Notis, De Vigionaris Treatise des Chiffres, Falconer's Cryptomonesis Petafacta, Davis's and Thick's 18th century treatises, and such fairly modern authorities as Blair von Martin and Kluber's Cryptographic. He interspersed his study of the books with attacks on the manuscript itself, and in time, became convinced that he had to deal with one of those subtlest and most ingenious of cryptograms, in which many separate lists of corresponding letters are arranged like the multiplication tables, and the message built up with arbitrary keywords known only to the initiated. The older authorities seemed rather more helpful than the newer ones, and Armitage concluded that the code of the manuscript was one of great antiquity, no doubt handed down through a long line of mystical experimenters. Several times, he seemed near daylight 
only to be set back by some unforeseen obstacle. Then, as September approached, the clouds began to clear. Certain letters, as used in certain parts of the manuscript, emerged differently and unmistakably. It became obvious that the text was indeed in English. On the evening of September 2nd, the last major barrier gave way, and Dr. Armitage read, for the first time, a continuous passage of Wilbur Waitley's Annals. It was, in truth, a diary, as all had thought, and it was coached in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Almost the first long passage that Armitage deciphered, an entry dated November 26, 1916, proved highly startling and disquieting. It was written, he remembered, by a child of three and a half who looked like a lad of twelve or thirteen. Today learned that Aklo for the Sabbath, it ran, which did not like, it being unanswerable from the hill and not from the air, that upstairs more ahead of me than I had thought it would be, and is not like to have much earth brain, shot Elam Hutchison's collie Jack when he went to bite me, and Elam says he would kill me if he dies. I guess he won't. Grandfather kept me saying the DHO formula last night, and I think... I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to those poles when the earth is cleared off, if I can't break through with the DHO HNA formula when I commit it. They from the air told me at Sabbath that it will be years before I can clear off the earth, and I guess Grandfather will be dead by then. So, I shall have to learn all the angles of the planes and all the formulas between the Yur and the Ninkur. They from outside will help, but they cannot take body without human blood. That upstairs looks it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the Vorish sign or blow the power of Ibn Ghazi at it and it is near like them at May Eve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared, and there are no earth beings on it. He then came with the Aklo Sabaoth, said I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. Morning found Dr. Armitage in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. He had not left the manuscript all night, but sat at his table under his electric light, turning page after page with shaking hands as fast as he could decipher the cryptic text. He had nervously telephoned his wife that he would not be home and when she brought him a breakfast from the house, he could scarcely dispose of a mouthful. All that day he read on, now and then halted maddeningly as a re reapplication of the complex key became necessary. Lunch and dinner were brought to him, but he ate only the smallest fraction of either. Toward the middle of the next night, he dozed off in his chair, but soon woke out of a tangible oh. but soon woke out of a tangle of nightmares almost as hideous as the truths and menaces to man's existence that he had just uncovered. On the morning of September fourth, Professor Rice and Dr. Morgan insisted on seeing him for a while, and they departed trembling and ashen gray. That evening, he went to bed, but slept only fitfully. Wednesday, the next day, he was back at that manuscript and began to take copious notes, 
both from the current sections and from those he had already deciphered. In the small hours of the night, he slept a little in an easy chair in his office, but was at the manuscript again before dawn. Some time before noon, his physician, Dr. Hartwell, called to see him, and insisted that he cease his work. He refused, intimating that it was of the most vital importance for him to complete the reading of this diary, and promising an explanation in due course of time. That evening, just as twilight fell, he finished his terrible pursuit and sank back exhausted. His wife, bringing his dinner, found him in a half-comatose state, but he was conscious enough to warn her off with a sharp cry when he saw her eyes wander toward the notes he had taken. Weakly rising, he gathered up the scribbled papers and sealed them all in a giant envelope, which he immediately placed in his inside coat pocket. He had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put him to bed, he could only mutter over and over again, But what in God's name can we do? Dr. Armitage slept, but was partly delirious the next day. He made no explanations to Hartwell, but in his calmer moments spoke of the imperative need of a long conference with Rice and Morgan. His wilder wanderings were very startling indeed, including frantic appeals that something in a boarded-up farmhouse be destroyed, and frantic references to some plan for the extirpation of the entire human race and all animals and vegetable life from the earth by some terrible elder race of beings from another dimension. He would shout that the world was in danger, since the elder things wished to strip it and drag it away from the solar system and cosmos of matter into some other plane or phase of entity from which it had once fallen. Vigintillions of eons ago. At other times, he would call for the dreaded Necronomicon and the Demonolateria of Remingus, in which he seemed hopeful of finding some formula to check the peril he conjured up. Stop them! Stop them! he would shout. Those Waitleys meant to let them in. And the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must do something. It's a blind business. But I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August, when Wilbur Waitley came here to his death. And at that rate. But Armitage had a sound physique, despite his 73 years, and slept off his disorder that night without developing any real fever. He woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober with a gnawing fear and tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon, he felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for a conference. And the rest of that day and evening, the three men tortured their brains in the wildest speculations and the most desperate debate. Strange and terrible books were drawn voluminously from the stack shelves and from secure places of storage, and diagrams and formula were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of skepticism there was none. All three had seen the body of Wilbur Waitley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building, and after that, not one of them could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's ravings. Opinions were divided as to notify the Massachusetts State Police, and the negative finally won. There were things involved which simply could not be believed by those who had not seen a sample, as indeed was made clear 
during certain subsequent investigations. Late at night, the conference disbanded without having developed a definite plan, but all day Sunday, Armitage was busy comparing formula and mixing chemicals obtained from the college laboratory. The more he reflected on the hellish diary, the more he was inclined to doubt the efficacy of any material agent in stamping out the entity which Wilbur Waitley had left behind him. The earth-threatening entity, which unknown to him, was to burst forth in a few hours and become the memorable Dunwick Horror. Monday was a repetition of Sunday with Dr. Armitage, for the task at hand required an infinity of research and experiment. Further consultations of the monstrous diary brought about various changes of the plan. And he knew that even in the end, a large amount of uncertainty must remain. By Tuesday, he had a definite line of action mapped out and believed he would try a trip to Dunwick within a week. Then, on Wednesday, the great shock came. Tucked obscurely away in a corner of the Arkham Advertiser was a fastidious little item from the Associated Press, telling what a record-breaking monster the bootleg whiskey of Dunwick had raised up. Armitage, half-stunned, could only telephone for Rice and Morgan. Far into the night, they discussed and the next day was a whirlwind of preparation on the part of them all. Armitage knew he would be meddling with terrible powers, yet saw that there was no other way to annul the deeper and more malign meddling which others had done before him. Alright, thank you all so much for watching, and um, I hope you enjoyed that. Please like and subscribe, and thanks for supporting DJX Chronicles. Later on. I hope.